Good evening. My name is Michelle Yun, and I'm Senior Curator of Asian Contemporary Art and Associate Director of the Asia Society Triennial. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Asia Society for the panel discussion, Home and Away, Asian Artists in America, with participating triennial artists Shazia Sikander and Jordan Nasser. This panel discussion is organized in conjunction with our inaugural Asia Society Triennial that just opened to the public this past Tuesday, October 27th. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Triennial, it's the first recurring initiative in the United States with the mandate to champion contemporary Asian and Asian American artists within a global context. The Triennial provides an internationally recognized platform for these artists to push the boundaries of their respective art practices and to meaningfully engage with new audience whom they may, would not otherwise encounter. The inaugural Triennial Edition, We Do Not Dream Alone, features over 40 artists and artist group working across mediums from 20 countries throughout Asia and the diaspora. This exciting new initiative will be on view in two parts from October 27th, 2020 through June 27th, 2021, and will be accompanied by an exhibition catalog and a robust roster of public programs. We look forward to welcoming you back to Asia Society Museum here in New York to experience this exciting exhibition. To learn more about the Triennial and how to visit, please go to our website, www.asiasociety.org front slash triennial. For our members who are tuning in this evening, we thank you for your steadfast support of our work, especially now. Your generosity nourishes our resolve to persevere despite these challenging times. And for those of you who are new to Asia Society, we encourage you to become involved. Membership details may be accessed on our website, asiasociety.org front slash support front slash membership. The program this evening will include a presentation by each of the artists, followed by about 30 minutes of moderated discussion and five minutes left for questions from the audience. To submit a question, please send them through the comment or live chat sections in the Facebook or YouTube platforms. This program is being recorded and the conversation will be posted on the Asia Society website and our YouTube channel for further reference. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our esteemed panelists. Our first panelist this evening is Shazia Sikander. Shazia Sikander's pioneering practice pushes the boundaries of the Indo-Persian miniature painting tradition through experimentation with scale and diverse mediums, including animation, video, large scale murals and interdisciplinary collaborations. She was the founder of the Neo Miniature Movement in the early 1990s and has continued to serve as a trailblazer in the field ever since. The artist deftly explores the complex origins of contested cultural, religious and political histories through imagery appropriated from popular culture, current events and mythology. The artist received a BFA from the National College of Arts in Lahore in 1991 and an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 1995. Sikander was a recipient of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Genius Award in 2006 and the U.S. State Department Medal of Art in 2012. Or sorry, yes, 2012, pardon me. Sikander's exhibition, Weeping Willows, Liquid Tongues, will be on view at Sean Kelly Gallery from November 5th to December 19th. Next, I'd like to introduce Jordan Nasser. Jordan Nasser's meticulously crafted embroidered works depict imagery, imaginary landscapes that fuse craft with concept. Growing up within the Palestinian diaspora inspired the artist's engagement with traditional Palestinian decorative motifs. He uses these to address the socio-political histories and hierarchies that dictate the existence of Palestinians living in the West Bank and the imaginations of those who have left. These works are often realized with the assistance of women hired for, uh, sorry, of hired female artisans uh, from the West Bank. The partnership allows the women to build entrepreneurial businesses that provide an economic agency atypical within the region, while also connecting them to global networks. 
the artist received a BA from Middlebury College in 2007. Nasser is the subject of a solo exhibition entitled I Cut the Sky in Two, currently on view at James Cohen Gallery through November 21st. So please uh, join me in welcoming Shazia Sikander for the first presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Shazia. Thank you. This is wonderful. Um, good evening, everybody. So I will start um, by uh, saying that artists assist in new ways of thinking, reframing history and imagining new possibilities, which are part of the broader processes of transformation in a society. Often missing in such societal shifts are representations of and voices of women, both as victims of expunged narratives and also as leading voices to offer counter perspectives to our very prevalent masculinized histories and ways of being. So with that statement, I wanted to frame this current work because I'm gonna share uh, some very new recent works of mine. And this is my very first sculpture. And um, it has sort of the DNA of my practice. Um, the ideas encapsulated in this work, you know, refer to a lot of the earlier drawings and paintings that I was doing where I have critiqued and highlighted Western art history's classicism and ethnocentric reactions to Indian art as per Johan Joachim's Winkelmann's doctrine. So um, these multiple juxtapositions, unexpected detours, dissonance, jostling, shifting hierarchies were all strategies that I've employed over the years to destabilize and explode binary thinking in all its forms. So the non-binary gender identity is very layered in my work. It is particularly heightened in iconographies of women that are not tied to a heteronormative lineage or conventional articulations of diaspora and nation. The female protagonists can be equally androgynous, proactive, confident, intelligent, and in their playful stance, connected to the past in imaginative ways. They are the antithesis of the fictions of purity and authentic national culture. So just as an example, this work, Pleasure Pillars, the representations of gendered bodies takes on a particular valence in the context of imperial war and carnage at the start of Bush's war on terror. It is worth recalling that the initial human rights justification for the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001 was to, quote unquote, save mis Muslim women from Islamic extremism. Pleasure Pillar, speaks back to such paternalistic and fetishized gendered discourses and insists on revivifying submerged and forgotten narratives, genealogies, and traditions of pleasurable, sensuous, and joyous gendered embodiments. So uh, that was, uh, that was a, a quote from a guy, Tri Gopinath, the scholar, professor, director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality at NYU. And, um, you know, this uh, uh, current sculpture, when I was uh, working um, uh, on this piece, I had in 2017, the opportunity to be part of the New York City Mirrors Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers. And during that process, hearing different public opinions and studying the public monuments, their complicated histories, historical te reckoning tensions between communities, I decided that if I was ever to go make a sculpture, it would be uh, from the perspective of women and also a, sort of an anti-monument. So in, in this uh, particular piece, it, it is to scale made in um, clay, but to validate the two intertwined bodies and the incredible elasticity of their combined state, I worked with models first and then um, took the photos and used that as sketches and ideas that developed further the pieces in bronze, but then I have been also painting it. And um, 
the idea of, of coloring the bronze was also about highlighting that classical painted statuary was often polychromatic and not necessarily lily white as often constructed over time in popular imagination. Color Prejudice points out the historian Sarah Bond, how we color or fail to color classical antiquity is often a result of our own cultural values. So for me, connecting the patina to these larger discussions on color in classical sculpture also links the issue of classicism with American monuments and memorials that are often revered as symbols of patriotism in their classicism aesthetic. So when you're asking, you know, what stories are being represented in or commemorated in public spaces, often women and women of color are the least um, represented. So promiscuous intimacies engages with all such issues around race and representation. But, um, you know, um, a reinterpreting past has been a touchstone of my engagement with art for a long time. The history of non-Western art canon, including Indo-Persian miniature painting, mostly written by Western scholars at the time when I was studying in the late 80s, was, um, has, has been something of interest to me where I'm, I have been studying the legacy of colonial imperialism, highlighting the politics of provenance, ownership, narration, by taking a closer look at historical works, documents, unarchived materials to use as inspiration for various new directions in art history and in contemporary visual idiom. So when I started examining miniature painting as a young adult, the depiction of the woman often perturbed me. It bothered me that the female was often shown as a passive or, or dormant agency, silent or weak, either longing for the lover or awaiting a fate yet to unfold. So I wanted to make paintings where all of such representations could be challenged. And much of my iconography started to breach national boundaries, juxtaposing feminist writers, poets like Fahmi Daryaz, Isma Chiktai, Kishwar Nahid, Parveen Shakur, uh, Parveen Shakir, Angela Carter, Julia Kristeva, Helen Susu, etc., and Bell Hooks to understand feminist forms and in turn explore language from specific points and places of women's narratives. So um, another new work here, the two interlinked female protagonists, rich in detail and depth, are portrayed as a circular bloom. Having risen to the top, buoyant and afloat, they exist untethered to any specific time or place while being a critical part of the natural environment. So a lot of this work has come about by using, uh, working with different mediums and here of course with glass. Glass uh, remains a very um, uh, important material for me. I have been doing many public art, public commissions in, in, in glass using, um, um, using the materiality, the ability to create um, light and um, longevity of forms and uh, legibility through this particular medium. And uh, coming to like mosaic, actually, uh, I came to mosaic through having done um, video work. So the idea of the pixel made me think of the unit of the mosaic. But all of these works are very much tied to the act of drawing. And uh, how I um, think is through the nature of drawing. And when I, a lot of my work is informed by research and, you know, reading and history is substantially the account of the movements of objects and bodies, trade, slavery, migration, colonial occupation. These are underlying currents, the root axis of modernity. And history is also the recording of such um, um, uh, such notions, but also dressing up of these fundamental interests with ideological dross. So usually it's the highest bidder that, that often gets to tell the story. And in that respect, um, so much of, of the work here engages these histories of uh, maritime trade, movement of resources, commodities, such as bodies and oil, naval warfare, the East India Company, the Imperial air travel routes, et cetera. So that sort of is another theme that runs through the work. 
And um, with that, I wanted to share a series of new drawings, which, which uses the paradox of the culture of extraction. Which, uh, which is more, uh, which is concentrated in this iconography of the Christmas tree, which promises beneficent redemptive gifts while being an engine of extraction and the violence and immiseration of the planet that has attended the economy of oil in the past few decades. Again, a quote from the author ac academic Sadia Bas, who is also the co-editor of an upcoming monograph on my work. And, um, so this series uh, for me is really about the ecological condition, which is a mirror of the social conditions we are in, whether it's the erosion of climate, of borders, of rising waters, rising heat, displacement of bodies, war. And with that is a new film that I've made, which is also on view next week at Sean Kelly Gallery. And this, uh, piece Reckoning is made from multiple drawings. It reveals the cyclical theme of struggle through kinetic forms, reflecting upon such relationships that embody a moment of reckoning, such as between migrant and citizen, women and power, human and nature. This short video sort of restages um, the imaginary historical Indo-Persian Turkish miniature painting. And uh, the upheaval embodied in the uprooted tree for me is very much about the transcendental homelessness of the modern era, the lurking threat of possible eco-catastrophe, as well as the capacity to use inner turmoil from dark to light as a defining feature of the creative spirit. So here I will end by saying that Eurocentricism has been operable throughout art history and history when we inherit one-sided or polarized constructions of the past, we often unconsciously keep marching down the same well-preserved paths. The notion of home and authentic state is embedded within my practice as an artist, but it not in any definitive ideology, nationalism, or geography. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shazia, that was fabulous. And I can't wait to mine some of the ideas that you raised during your talk. Thank you. So next, um, I'd like to invite Jordan to present his work and then we'll uh, begin our dialogue. Thank you, Jordan. <clears throat> Hello, good evening. All right, let me see if I can get this screen sharing the right way. Okay. Um, so as mentioned previously, I primarily work with Palestinian embroidery, or um, originally started working with Palestinian embroidery about 10 years ago. Um, here you can see some of the types of things that are traditionally made using embroidery in Palestine. So it's mainly women's dresses and items for the home as like an extension of that. Um, and this is, um, essentially it's a craft that has become really emblematic of Palestinian culture in terms of, especially for members of the diaspora, it's kind of like we all have these pillows and these things in our houses and some people are lucky enough to have ancestors dresses or even um, the women in their family still make their own. Um, but in Palestine is very much still practiced. It's also become quite a, um, like a tourist object industry so everyone wants to buy pillows and little wallets and stuff like that so a lot of the women who practice this traditionally also make things for sale um for markets and stuff like that but um it's definitely arguably the most representative visual of palestinian culture i would say and so i started working with this about 10 years ago and um this is a more recent work but it's uh evolved into um, essentially using the patterns and the techniques. So I embroider this by hand, um, just like a Palestinian woman would, um, using traditional patterns, but then instead of applying the, the colors to the patterns the way they would, I go across them and I'm able to figuratively work with color and uh, depict kind of landscapes or to varying extents of uh, abstraction. But um so this is a piece from my show that's just closed in LA 
Um, and yeah, there's just some more pieces here. Maybe I'll let the slideshow run a little bit while I talk. Um, and I think for me, um, part of it was that I grew, part of like the choice of working with this medium was that I grew up in New York, um, very raised to very much identify with Palestine um, and with a lot of Arab family in the area. Um, and yet, I'm very American and didn't go to Palestine um, until I was the first time I went, I was 15 years old. Um, and so I think that at a certain point in my life, I was just trying to figure out my relationship to Palestine and my, how, what it means to be Palestinian American. And um, I think an urge to connect with that heritage, um, which I imagine is very common among people of various diasporas, but especially Palestinian. And for me, the notion of spending my day kind of the way a Palestinian might, in the sense of like having this embroidery as something I do every day, um, just kind of was a beautiful thought. And I uh, basically got what I, <laughs> what I asked for because I do it every day now. Um, but these pieces, so the piece that's up on the screen right now is part of the triennial, and this is part of a series later. Um, it's an ongoing body of work, essentially, and it's uh, works made in collaborations in collaboration with women in the West Bank. And as I mentioned before, the, the kind of impetus for starting to work with Palestinian embroidery was to find a connection, um, a personal connection to my Palestinian heritage and culture. And these collaborative works are kind of even more than I could have dreamed of, which is that I get to actually work with Palestinians and be a part of their embroidering community. And um, the process of making these works is collaborative to an extent, like, you know, so the process is that I start off by um, choosing patterns and laying them out. I'll always use traditional Palestinian patterns um, and, but the layouts of them. So in this one, you can see there's four bars of kind of different patterns. You That is not a composition that you would see on a dress, um, but these each pattern is something that you might find on a dress. And so there's a kind of contemporary application of the patterns themselves. And then obviously when I do the landscape, that's like something very different than what's going on in Palestine. However, for these collaborations, I lay out the piece in black and white. And then I kind of erase from that pattern the part that I plan on embroidering myself later and then give it to the women to apply color to as they see fit. And that for me is um, basically a, an opportunity to capture this living cultural practice of this embroidery. Because each woman who does it has, her aesthetics are informed not only by her own taste, but also the style of her mother or grandmother or community. And so I think that it's really, for me, it's very important to um, in, have that captured in the works that are collaborations with the women. I don't wanna just like commission them to make me something specific. I want them to use the styles that are like the current styles in Palestine or, and for a lot of them, it also means traditional styles. And then for me um, as an exercise in a sense is, it's always, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to get back from them. And so when I receive the, the embroideries back from Palestine, it's always fun and sometimes challenging to figure out what to do with my part of the canvas um, in response to the colors that they've chosen and um, different aesthetic choices that they've made. Because sometimes they do very minimal and they, kind of, they could do the, the whole, like this, you can see this piece is much more, um, this is also in the triennial, but this is much more, the black and the green are, almost hard to see the difference of it. It feels just like a very muted backdrop for whatever landscape I'm gonna do. So, um, and this body of work is ongoing. And as you also mentioned before, it matters to me that, um, I'm gonna go back one. It matters to me that the, the women are involved in this process, not only, as I mentioned before, because of the emotional notion of me like getting to do something in Palestine and be a part of something in Palestine. And in a sense be, um, yeah, just part of that community. But then also uh, 
you know, uh, involved, like, I don't know, I think uh, the fact that there are actual Palestinians involved in the making of a lot of my works, uh, just as meaningful in terms of um, me not just doing it, because in some senses, I'm also just an American. And so I wouldn't, you know, there's like this question of authenticity that um, we kind of talked about the other day that maybe we'll get to. Um, and, you know, kind of conflicts with the notions of cultural appropriation and this and that and and where for a member a half Palestinian member of the diaspora like where that puts me because at times I do feel like I'm appropriating and then I am like wait but I am Palestinian I just am not what one might imagine as Palestinian anyway uh we'll get to that but um all in all these collaborative works are I think um I don't know, just very special for me personally. And I love doing them and I love that they're in the triennial. Um, next we have, this is an installation that I did um, in Tel Aviv last year. And this was kind of a completely new direction for me. Um, I essentially was offered a show at, a, at the Center for Contemporary Art in Tel Aviv. And before that, I feel like the conversations around my work and that I wanted to have around my work were a lot about the situation in Palestine, the the, the 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 issues surrounding it, and um, just calling attention to and educating, especially American and Western audiences, about um, the occupation and about the history um, of like modern day Palestine. But so so the notion of having a show in Palestine, Israel, in Tel Aviv. Um, was kind of a challenge for me in the sense of like, well, what do I want to talk about with an Israeli and Palestinian audience? Because they don't need to hear my like edge, like, you know, my, my spiel for so long had been towards an American audience about like teaching them or, or sharing about um, the, the happenings and situation in Palestine. And so um, the challenge for me was to think of what I would want to talk about with an audience in Israel and Palestine. And I realized that, the thing that I had to share that I feel like they might not hear so much of is this diaspora experience, right? This, this experience of being raised, feeling attached to this culture and identifying with this culture and also being so far from that culture and really not a part of that culture and having a lot of my understanding of that culture be misunderstandings because of a language barrier and because of simply being raised in a completely different culture. And so I essentially created my my apartment, so to speak, for when I return. Because in the Palestinian diaspora, as well as in Judaism, the notion of returning to this one same place is very central for both peoples. And so as a member of that, I was like, okay, so I'll make my apartment for when I return. And this is the whole, um, again, bringing up the, con the, the issues of diaspora and the dream of returning. And um, as I am craft inclined, I essentially spent a year traveling around Israel and Palestine, uh, seeking out artisans and craftspeople of every possible material and medium and made in collaboration with them every item in the entire apartment. Um, and so everything from embroidery, of course, to Bedouin weaving, olive wood carving, ceramic, tile stuff, woodworking, metalworking, uh, kind of, I mean, you can see some more back in this picture, actually. There's metal work, there's bamboo stuff, there's, you know, it's like, it's really just every little thing. Um, and so, and for me, that also brought up the question of, um, you know, instead of making this apartment that's like a, a nostalgic Palestinian apartment, I was thinking of, um, in 2019, I'm a member of the diaspora and I'm returning. What is it that I'm returning to? Like, what is there in between the river and the sea? Like, what is there now? And I asked that question, um, or I sought to maybe answer that question by um, making this apartment out of crafts that are currently in Israel, Palestine, which includes many um, immigrant populations from all over the Middle East and Europe, and especially recently, um, most recently Sudanese, but also Ethiopian populations and all these populations that are now a part of what is the people that make up this place. And so for me, it was more of a, like a future looking, um, like exploration and like trying to understand what Israel Palestine actually is, not what we imagine it to be, whether you're imagining Israel, a Jewish nation, or you're imagining Palestine, um, 
anyway, so and that and that that led me to a lot of you know exciting collaborations with crafts that I didn't even know how they were made and learning so much about it and going to all the workshops and in the future will be leading to me starting to work with some of these media. Um, the first of which have been glass is, is glass work that I um, discovered. These are just some more pictures of some of the objects, but um, I, I, I included a bunch of um, glass objects from traditional glass workers in Hebron. And I have been making sculptures in the same technique as them. So um, the apartment has kind of led me to new, to new arenas. Um, this is a piece recently from my um, presentation at the ADA Art Fair this past February. And for this installation, um, I essentially, there's a dress in this table, there you can see it. And that is an antique dress from over a hundred years ago from Palestine that I bought from a Palestinian kind of antiques merchant in Jerusalem. And I created a body of work where I took essentially, like you see the, the rectangular panel on the chest became um, one of the small pieces you see here kind of on the right wall facing you. Um, so it's like, deconstructing the different areas of patterning on the dress and separating them out into panels that I then re-embroider with landscapes cutting across them instead. Um, so that was like a, kind of a one, like every, every piece in this, is, in this installation came or sprung, so to speak, from that dress and including the color palette and stuff like that. So it all goes back to the aesthetic decisions of that woman, the patterning, which patterns to put where, all that kind of stuff is drawn directly from the dress. Um, this is new work that is up in James Cohan right now, um, where it's again collaborative with women in Palestine, um, but with this split screen kind of theme going on where um, the sky is cut into as the title of the show is. Um, and in a lot of ways, these are very formal uh, experimentations and different um, just directions to go. And this is another piece in the James Cohan show that is one of the largest I've ever made. It's like nine feet long, um, again, collaborative, but with the landscape kind of continuously. So it's almost like behind a screen or something. It's like obscured, but then it's still continual. Um, this is a making of that piece in my studio. <laughs> And yeah, another shot of the James Cohan show where you can see some of the glass pieces as well on the pedestals here. So trying to translate that landscape and color work um, kind of visual language into a completely different material. And I love that like the embroideries are soft and warm and textile and then the glass are and metal and are, are like hard and cold. And it just has this nice balance for me. And as Shazia mentioned, like light has been a very challenging and exciting new thing to have be an element in the work where it's actually, I didn't realize it before I started making the glass pieces that it's not just about color anymore. It's also, it's about transparency versus like opacity. And like that element is tricky and challenging and exciting to work with. Um, that would be a great segue, Jordan, um, maybe to start our conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm ready. I, I think that's it. Oh yeah, okay, well, this is just. Uh, some more close-ups but okay i will stop sharing <laughs> right i should stop right yeah we should probably okay conversation. but thank you um it's great to see your work and to get that really kind of detailed narrative of your process and evolution um i mean i think the commonality of both of your presentations to me was really um you know this idea of authenticity and agency and I thought maybe we could start our conversation with that idea um, and thinking about audience in the mix of that. I mean, you know, both of you are taking culturally specific and traditional um, art genres, um, you know, and in your case, Jordan, more decorative art genre. Um, and, you know, and hybrid, you know, and kind of, using that as a, a basis, but then really making it your own from your own experience and using it as a platform for other dialogues and other narratives. And I, I guess if both of you could elaborate a little bit how you feel that 
the relationship of authenticity um, of using materials or kind of the agency as, you know, Shazia, your position as somebody who is from originally from Pakistan, but expatriated in the diaspora and using it in a different context in Jordan, somebody from the diaspora who then, you know, is collaborating with, you know, artisans from the home country, like where, where does the often, you know, is there, is there kind of a spectrum of authenticity or agency of how you use it and where you use it and how it's received and where it's being presented? Um, Shazia, maybe do you want to start on that thought? Well, I, um, I think I would like to point out that um, when we're talking about this idea of, of a genre, right? So in, in terms of the Indian Persian um, manuscript painting, painting, painting tradition and the various schools within it, so much of that history is so truncated. It is also um, part of our colonial histories. So it has been plundered and it does exist in, in storages of many Western institutions. So they, this idea of who gets to frame that history is very pertinent to the contemporary practices of um, mining that, engaging it, uh, decolonizing, all these terms that we often are hearing for, you know, we've been hearing them for a long time, but so much of this this aspect is, is rooted in, in our states of being. So when I examine a lot of this uh, material or these histories, I am also thinking, I think of myself as a detective. I'm interested in the, in the provenance. I'm interested in how so much of the material left, where it left from and what geographically how diverse um, a region that may have been and who gets to determine um, those histories, right? Who gets to frame them? So these, that's how, that's where I start to make work. It is not rooted in the geography of Pakistan. Yes. It's not rooted in any nationalistic fervor or nationalism. It's rooted in our broader colonial histories, which again, you know, are, they, they bleed across different aspects of definition of, of culture, boundary, race, religion, all these, all these um, aspects. So I wanted to clarify that and point that separation out that this dichotomy, it's not as simple as the diaspora somebody having left and being in a diaspora versus this idea of the authentic and the pure or being yeah. in the notion of the home. So for me, authenticity lies within the work. Notion lies within the work. And that work is, as an artist, always shifting, expanding. It's very based, it is based on research, but it is um, in the act of making the work that uh, things happen, things materialize. And also to point out that when, as artists, you know, when you're between cultures, when you're between, um, between, uh, represent, between places, there's always going to be a sense of loss and a sense of gain. That you will please some people, you will displease others. Perceptions will alter and shift. And they... They, they, they are so much more radicalized right now in our current state of the world where we are policing who represents what, when we are policing uh, who, what is cultural authenticity, cultural representation, where uh, in our current culture in America, you know, all of these things, I think um, how I see my practice is really that it has been a product of engaging much of this, th these sentiments and expanding the boundaries. So participating in the definition of, of art 
at a global, at a larger, broader scale, affecting like pra affecting like determining what is American art, what is the scope of American art, the way immigration expands the boundaries, where the how immigrants play a role in what continues to be imagined as the American idea, right? So in that sense, yes. But in many other ways, it's not like one has been divorced from this idea of where one grew up. I go to Pakistan many times in a year and fa have family there. So that we cannot uh, under uh, yeah underplay that mobility has been, there is mobility, of course, now moving forward in this COVID period, we, there's a lot that will get uh, determined, you know, with time sure. right now. Um, but that, that aspect, that the, the freedom as a visual artist that I feel I have to take, where I have to br question these boundaries. Sure. I mean, and I think, you know, to your point, Shazia, about this kind of third space or this feeling of being displaced. I mean, that was something that Jordan and I spoke about the other day. And Jordan, maybe if you can talk about that a little bit from your own experience and maybe how that inspired you to, you know, move into this practice using the embroidery. Right. Um, well, I think, I mean, I just want to say really quickly about just kind of in response to what Shazi was, was talking about is that I think that, um, I think that you know, Shazia's work, like you, your work is really, it is, it's in a sense universal, but it's using your person. I mean, you have your perspective and that's informed by where you're from and what you're, you know, around what culture, you're, you know, everything, you know, and your own life. And so, and that's really like, and, you know, in, in these conversations about artists and, and appropriation, all this kind of stuff, I think, um, especially in my, in my personal um, example is that people assume a lot of things about like I'm trying to represent Palestinians or I'm not you know I'm not in that and then again and then get brings up what I will talk about which is um, kind of this belonging and not belonging and all this stuff and and ownership but at the end of the day it's like I think that as artists the goal is to speak um, like universally but you speak from your perspective right so you speak about things that can be applied to different you know um, like, like my use of Palestinian craft doesn't mean that the issues that I'm discussing are not universal. You know, it's just that it's coming from my perspective, which is what I have to offer. But, but hopefully, it's speaking about broader things. And I think that you know, which like Shazia was talking about that, and that's what I was hearing. You know, that like you're really talking about these bigger things, but of course, you're coming from the perspective of someone raised in Pakistan, and like that's just who you are. You know, so that's going to be what you maybe draw your examples from in your work, you know what I mean, and your visuals, um, because that's who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that you know, for Palestinians especially, I mean, I'm, for many people around the world, but in the case of Palestinians, there's also that where there's, you know, there's, there's Palestinians in the West Bank, there's Palestinians in Israel, there's Palestinians in Gaza, there's Palestinians in Middle Eastern countries, either in refugee camps or not, and then there's Palestinians in the West. Like everyone has a different perspective that there's, and 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 Shazia also mentioned like some people are gonna like it, some people aren't, and that's just you know the way things are. Um, and and for especially with Palestine, in in a sense where the country um, has been, it's it's this is our history is that it's been fragmented and scattered, and that we're we've been like kind of broken apart and separated from each other. And that, you know, will lead to unfortunately, um, sometimes even like mistrust of people in the different, one of the different groups of Palestinians, right? So like, um, and I don't know. And I think that, um, yeah, I think that it's complicated. <laughs> and I think that, um, wait, can you remind me exactly the question you wanted me to answer? <laughs> I'm thinking about thinking about kind of being in this, you know, you were saying you were in this in-between space. Right. But maybe yeah. what is before you get to that point, I mean, I think, I think, Shazia, you, you know, I was being a little facile and kind of setting up this dichotomy, and I really appreciated your clarifications. And I think it is so complicated. And I think, you know, to kind of clarify my question a little bit more, you know, when we're talking about the subjectivity and kind of the point of reference when people are 
experiencing the work. I mean, you were talking a lot about colonialism and I think a lot of the work and your detective ship or, you know, kind of serving as a detective, you know, thinking about connoisseurship in the West with classical objects and just thinking about how these works were acquired originally, um, you know, and oftentimes questionable circumstances or even plain thievery. And I think mm -hmm. you're seeing that now and we're talking about kind of, again, agency or kind of taking, you know, uh, taking ownership or, you know, how are people taking ownership? Because, you know, when you're looking at some classical objects, they're being repatriated or people are saying, you know, that doesn't belong to you or you didn't. So I think, uh, but I think kind of going back to my question, you know, when you are being provocative through your work or using kind of aesthetic imagery um, as a platform to talk about other issues like climate change or about, you know, the kind of this kind of looking back at this colonial experience or, you know, through political um, dialogues, you know, do you, you know, do you see a difference or do you, how do you, do you, do you position your work differently depending on the context in which it's shown or how do you, do you notice a marked difference and, you know, why in terms of people's perceptions? Um, I make the art. I, when I make my work, it is really very intuitive. Mm -hmm. It is um, the culmination of having, you know, being a, a living person, very sensitive to the to things that are happening around me, to the social, political, cultural parameters that we are always negotiating. Mm -hmm. So for me, the act of making art is personal and political simultaneously. I would love to be part of many shows that I don't get invited to. <laughs> so in terms of positioning my work, I think it's more um, your terrain as a curator. I've often been in shows that I may not have wanted to be part of, but I didn't have a choice. They went ahead and borrowed work from some other collection. I have asked to be in shows or even at the Asia Society, for example, the um, a show on Pakistani art. I remember when that happened, I was told that it's only artists that live and make art in Pakistan, and that's why you're not in it. But when the show opened, many artists in it were from Melbourne, London, Chicago. So, so when you say how an artist positions their work, I disagree with that. I think uh, a lot of politics are such, and you know, in the nature of everything, that um, how one gets framed is often outside of, of the artist's domain. And, I, and I'm kind of sensitive and in the sense that all of that obviously is pro being processed because it's, it's just the nature of a broader situation. Mm -hmm. Art world is a very tiny little um, drop in a bigger ocean, right? And so in that respect, who we are and how it informs the work doesn't necessarily make the work autobiographical. Yeah. And that's the problems I often have is that no matter what you were, what one was doing, it was often like, oh, this must be the story of you because you are the other and we need to hear the story of the other. Or it's because you're a Muslim woman or it's a female artist or it's a younger female artist or it's the Asian American story. Or So I think all these categories after when one, obviously as a younger artist, I felt like I had to not get boxed into those categories. Well, but now with age, <laughs> I've realized how oh, great, the more the categories, the merrier it is. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, the work has to um, be able to uh, exist independent mm -hmm. or can be can exist over time. And what is that timelessness that how does how do you speak to that as an artist? And I think that's that's what 
I think of when I'm making my art or how I'm positioning myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And with, and Jordan, because you're using, you know, in some instances, you know, almost ancient patterns or patterns that have been ingrained in the society or, you know, in a region for centuries. I mean, how do you feel that, do you feel that there's a continuum or do you feel that you are kind of, you know, creating something that's completely separate or more conceptual from this right. tradition, um, you know, um, way? I would, no, I, I definitely, you know, at first uh, I was, I think, innocently using them as like, the, these are the Palestinian patterns that I'm doing Palestinian embroidery. And as I've been working with them, it's funny because uh, there came a, a point working with the women where my friend, so I have a friend who lives in the West Bank who helps me with the production because I'm not there that often. I'm there a couple times a year, hopefully, but not, you know, consistently enough to produce all this stuff. And so he's like my man on the ground there. And he's a member of their community. Like the women who embroider are women that he just knows that they do this. And he's kind of created this little group of women that work with me. Um, and he started mentioning like, ooh, they're like, they're, they love the colors you chose for this. They saw this piece and they're like making, you know, they're, and I started to be, almost like freaked out that I'm affecting them because they, in my eyes, they were like the, the source and I'm an American contem the contemporary artist, like yeah, riffing on, riffing on the Palestinian traditional stuff. And so the notion of me affecting their style was like, oh no, I don't do that. But then I realized like, you know, like they see me as a part of their community. Like they, they've seen my work in person and they have, been impressed with the technique and so then I get like I'm accepted you know like they've like oh, okay I earned that like you know I'm, I'm I'm good enough that they they uh they welcome me into the the crew of embroiderers um and so there is that where um I feel like using these patterns is is something um I don't I don't want to say like magical but like it's it's important to use them actually you know it's it's it wouldn't be palestinian I, you know there's cross stitch embroidery from almost every culture around the world like that's not what makes it palestinian it's the patterns you know and in a lot of ways also the composition of those patterns but the patterns themselves also um and so that's like very important to use those patterns and that you know as shazia mentioned some people will like it some people won't but you know when i i get a lot of great messages and stuff from palestinians wherever who have seen my work in a museum or something that are just so excited that palestinian embroidery specifically is like in a museum you know um and so there's definitely and and you know and, and it is it's the cultural thing where it's kind of like shared like ownership of the patterns and the patterns for sure it's like if there's one thing that the diaspora still does it's <laughs> Palestinian embroidery like that's one of the few things that you know I've been talking about this a lot recently but when you're in a, in a part of diaspora community like the things that travel best are like crafts and food like basically like if nothing else, you'll probably have exposure to those things in part of the diaspora. Might not be the language, might not be the like daily way of life, but you'll have objects around and you'll probably eat some food <laughs> that is like the traditional food. And, you know, a lot of my work recently has been thinking about the extreme of that where that becomes all you know of the culture. And then it's kind of this superficial understanding or this object-based understanding of a culture which is, I think, another kind of cost of being part of a diaspora. But um, yeah, but I would say, as I said, like the patterns are, it's important that they actually are the Palestinian ones. Well, um, I mean, this session went by very quickly. Oh no, it's over already? <laughs> but I guess maybe I'll ask one more provocative question. I mean, you know, both of you are participating in the Asia, Tri Asia Society Triennial specifically, and you know the impetus for um, for realizing this initiative was really to provide a platform for artists who we felt were being underrepresented in the larger field, and you know because it's focusing on a particular 
you know, the region of Asia and the diaspora. I mean, you know, you could look at it both ways. You could look at it that you're championing a group, but then you're also ghettoizing them. And I'm curious from your perspectives and be honest, please, you know, do you think that, <laughs> you know, do you think that this type of exhibition is successful in this moment? Um, do you think it's necessary because it is, you know, allowing a platform or do you feel that it's more problematic or, you know, causes um, problematic per perceptions of, of the work and of, of people's, you know, kind of, again, putting people in a box? Um, I don't know if either of you would like to. I, I can start. Uh, I think that it actually goes, it goes back to something Shazi said along the way, but like, I mean, uh, for me, um, I fit into this group uh, for the Age of Society Triennial, but I also fit into queer artists and craft artists and, you know, this not so like Arab and Islamic and this, you know what I mean? There's a lot of different things. And as Shazi said, like, the more the better, <laughs> like more labels, that, you know, it's fine. Um, so that's always been my perspective. And like, as I've also been in like, shows focusing on textiles or shows, like, you know, and so I think that that's, um, I don't think it's ghettoizing when these days, because there's just so much of it. But also, I think that your scope, I mean, you know, it is rare that people are like, would consider me Asian, but it's true. It's like, that's, you know, the Middle East is part of Asia. And it's not, especially in the American consciousness, like that's not <laughs> associated with Asia. Um, and so I would also say that you have a very responsible and broad sense of the word. <laughs> so I think that that's probably a good sign in terms of that. Um, and yeah, so that's my two cents about it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing in this case. <laughs> well, I would just uh, say that a institutional support, like where you're showing a large amount of artists and many of the artists uh, you have commissioned works, there are many artists that are probably showing for the first time, like that is much more important than what people, what might be, whether how it's gonna be considered. Mm -hmm. The support behind, which allows a multiplicity of artists to get supported, to show their work, to make their work and put that out, especially at this time is much, it, it's, the, that supersedes anything else. That's my um, two cents. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate that because I think it is tricky, you know, and I think for Asia Society, because that is our area of expertise, you know, it's, we want, it's sometimes a fine line, I think. Right. Come to these kind I of also things. think there's something to be said for what the artist's work are about. Because if it's, you know, if the work has kind of nothing to do with they're something to do with them being Asian or part of, you know, like maybe I could see that it's not fitting, but like if there's any shred of, and it co I mean, it's more likely that there would be a threat anyway, but, um, but you know what I mean? Cause the part of my issue with these group shows that are either identity based or medium based is that they're, that doesn't mean that like, especially as like a group of all women or a group of all this or that it's like, but the work is not about anything in common and that that becomes problematic for me but if the work you know from, from what i've of the artists that i'm familiar with in the show because i haven't seen the show yet um so i haven't discovered all the new the artists that i haven't um that i'm not familiar with yet but from the ones i know it's it seems fitting to me as well that the content relates to that asian heritage or um or where they live you know and so um i would say that that also but i think obviously shazi is very right about. Well, I mean, I wish we had so much more time because there's so many elements of both of your practices that I would love to, you know, parse out further. But um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, we do have a couple of questions. There's one question for um, Jordan. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about um, the significance of including landscapes in your work. Um, uh, yes. Windows, That's there's th this is twofold. So basically, it's fundamentally the use of landscape was inspired originally by Atal Adnan's paintings, um, 
but more because of how that her biography and her writing interacts with her paintings and what meaning is then put onto them for me as a lover of her writing and painting. Um, and, but what it developed into for me, you know, what, you know, when it comes to Palestine and Israel, like obviously land is like the central thing. And I love that that visual is relating to it. And in a lot of ways, I've thought about my landscapes as imat like, you know, um, many people, especially in the Palestinian diaspora, aren't able to travel to Palestine. So Palestine itself becomes this place that is far away, that is like um, visitable and lives in these people's imaginations. Um, many people I know. And I just realized over time that the way that they talked about it was like, it it sounded like a fairyland. Like it sounded like so idyllic and utopian. And I love the notion that any of these landscapes that I make could be a potential Palestine. And it kind of speaks to the diaspora's longing for this place that doesn't really exist because the way that they're picturing it is fantastical. Um, and so that's the one thing I love about working with landscapes. And then the other thing is on a formal level where it's like, I personally um, have a harder time with like pure abstraction. And when I feel like I know what I'm looking at, I feel like I'm able to uh, access the work better. And so I like giving viewers a kind of ability to locate themselves, know, get a sense for what they're looking at. Um, I always found that comforting and works like Etal, like artists like Etal Adnan, Paul Giragossian, like people that abstract and, min and, and minimalize figuration, but still are figurative, I, is like my favorite zone uh, for work with color, essentially, and formal work. So that's kind of why I keep it, keep it up. Thank you. And uh, the final question is one for Shazia. So Shazia, uh, this question says, uh, each time you delve into a new medium, do you feel any different in terms of going into an unfamiliar realm, like perhaps learning a new language or you know, to express yourself? Or, and do you think that it's important to evolve as there are certain points better expressed through certain certain mediums. Um, so then do you deliberately seek out those new mediums to kind of find other avenues of expression? Um, yeah. uh, absolutely. I For me, it's very challenging every, like I have to learn in depth the language. I enjoy that for whatever crazy reason, it is, um, it's a learning process and it's ongoing. So when I started collaborating with uh, the composer, De Yun, for example, now it's been a whole decade of working together. I have learned so much about the possibility that composition allows in terms of narrative, in terms of an emotionality, the, the, the collaborative nature of performance that comes forth from having worked with um, um, musicians, poets and um, composer. So I did not anticipate all of that in the beginning. It was very intuitive. So the intuitiveness is very much at the core. I, uh, when I started working with glass, as I said earlier, it was, uh, it was because I was doing public artwork and I had to think of the longevity of a material works on paper were not gonna work. So I had to solve the problem. So in solving the problem, I wasn't afraid to engage with the material that functioned the best for the problem at hand. And um, that sort of is be the behind the scene is always, there's a reason for it. It's not just a oh, random. And, um, but there is a certain sense of humility that comes when you have to uh, be on your feet, when you have to think ahead, you have to learn, you have to grapple, you have to, you know, rather than just being uh, comfortable in your practice, in, in being, I get bored, I cannot be repetitive. So, but I feel like I put all of these parameters on myself because I, I'm always, I'm, challenging myself more so that's very important for me I hope that answered but what ties all of that together is simple it's the act of drawing so for me when I draw I'm literally uh thinking thinking through the hand that's fabulous 
Well, thank you so much to you both for your um, generosity of time and your insights. I really look forward to continuing these dialogues with you offline. Um, and thank you so much. This was really fabulous. So, thank you, Michelle. Thank, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. I hope that you'll come to visit us at the Asia Society Museum to see the fabulous work of Shazia and Jordan. And please tune in for future public programs. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.